So my name is James Hoffman. I am a co-founder and I suppose managing director of Square Mile Coffee Roasters in London. The WBC plays an interesting role in my professional life. It was, it's obviously been a, a key moment in my career to date, but I suppose it's been long enough ago now that I, I have a little bit of context to the whole thing. So I've been in coffee maybe 12, 13 years now. I started in 2003, 2004, and then won the WBC in 2007. So initially in those, in those first four years or so, it was very much an aspirational thing as well as a functional thing. It, was, uh, it wasn't just that I wanted to be better, it was actually a tool to help me be better. And so the competition for me was one of those things that was wonderful because it was this moment of learning that was intense, unlike anything else. And, and really the only way I could get that learning was to compete and go into it. So um, I suppose for the first part of my coffee career, it was really a, a tool and a vehicle for my learning. Um, and then it became something different after, after I won. And in many ways, I actually learned much quicker then. Like, it, the doors open and, and like the world of coffee is sort of more accessible to you. And the speed at which I could learn and the opportunities to learn undeniably grew exponentially. Uh, but I don't think you think about that beforehand. I don't think you think that you you don't compete, I mean, you kind of do maybe, but like, you don't think winning is the key to learning, in, in a way. After winning the competition, there's this really strange moment where for the first two or three weeks, nobody calls, nobody calls, and you start to freak out, and then, um, after about a month, people start to call and they're like, hey, I know you're really busy, but you're like, no, 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 I have time. And, and I think that at the, back in 2007 when you won, you kind of felt like, I, I don't really know what I do now. I don't really know what's supposed to happen now. And I think the, the WCE has done a lot more recently to help funnel the champion into the community and engage them a little bit more. So I, I think the role now is different to then. Um, and you don't really know what you're supposed to do, but, and you get a lot of opportunities. And, um, for me, I just wanted to, uh, to learn as much as I could. So you go into this role where you feel like you're, you're technically going to share and teach uh, and sort of, you know, uh, be an ambassador of, of quality and knowledge. But at the same time, you're also looking for these opportunities to, to be on the other end of that, to, to be the learning person to, to do that stuff. Uh, and I think the word ambassador was a very strong word around the time I won, that, that that was what the specialty community was looking for. And in many ways, it kind of speaks to how people misunderstand the competition. Um, because back then it was written into the rules that, you know, that the point of the competition was to look for an ambassador. And that the point of the competition was to find somebody who could perform technically and could be engaging or whatever else. And people were like, the competition doesn't replicate cafes, or, and you're like, no, 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 it's a game based on making coffee designed to find an ambassador for a year. Like, that's the point of this. And like, it doesn't engage the public, and you're like, no, 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 that's not, the, the point of the competition is not to be engaging to the general public. If it were, you'd be able to tell what's happening by watching. Uh, and that's not how that works, because we want a taste-driven thing. So, yeah, I think you kind of felt like you ought to go and be an ambassador for specialty coffee. And um, I suppose I was lucky that I knew a couple of past champions a little bit, like Klaus uh, or Trulls or Tim. And I could ask a few questions and be like, hey, what am I supposed to do here? And I think one of the upsides of there being more champions than ever is that you can talk to each other and, and kind of, you feel a little bit less alone. I think there are big differences between the national competitions and the world level competition. Um, and obviously that depends very much on, on the national competition itself. And in some ways you see competitors that would almost do better on the world stage than the national stage because I think the desire for big ideas at the world level is a little bit more than at the national level. You know, like uh, I think the national level is really about excellence, it's about performance, but there is a, there's less of a soapbox at a national level, and there's less of a soapbox again at a regional level. Um, 
because I think that you, you, you talk about what you have to say at a national stage versus saying to the world, and it is the world in many ways. There are 50 plus nations involved in this. There are people from all over the world coming, listening. There are now people, thousands of people watching it online. So I, I think the opportunity to speak to your community is taken more often at the world level than it is at the national level. And I, I think it, it probably speaks to the level of development of a national competition in terms of how big ideas are presented there. So more developed national competitions like the US or the UK or Australia tend to see bigger ideas presented by baristas in the finals, whereas younger national competitions tend to be a little bit more traditional and a little bit more about scoring the points, delivering great coffee and, and kind of doing what's expected in a way. I think there have been ideas presented on stage that have worked their way back to the real world. I don't think there's been a ton of them. Uh, you know, I think the, the classic easy example of that is someone like Matt Perger's EK43 thing that sort of swept back in. And, and it, it had been going on, there was a bunch of people around the world all playing with EKs before Matt did that. But the competition gave it a visibility, I think, that was new. Um, and I think that Many people have tried and you know to to argue ideas about customer service, about engagement at a competition level in the hope that we bring more of that back. Uh, because ultimately technical innovation has diminishing returns at this point compared to human interaction innovation. Our ability to emotionally engage people around coffee will yield bigger dividends than intellectually engaging them around coffee. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there are often ideas, and I'm you know, thinking about myself when I competed, that you want to present that are more relevant to the competition arena itself. Um, you, know, you know, when I was competing, it was a really big deal that I wanted to use like a single estate coffee from Costa Rica for my espresso course. And at that point, everyone's espresso blends were kind of the same. Like everyone was using like a nice Brazil base. There was probably something from Guatemala in there. There was a nice coffee from Ethiopia. Whether that was washed or natural was kind of your point of difference. And then maybe a sprinkle of something unusual, like a Sumatra for body or you know what I mean? Like it was, it was classic blend building. It was still very much a thing. And so it felt really risky, but necessary to do a single estate Costa Rican coffee and that, you know, didn't have much body and it was aromatic and complex, but it was not traditional. Or you, I used a coffee from a Kenyan estate for my cappuccinos and that was just a weird tasting cappuccino, but I was like, it's good. It's kind of jammy and fruity. Drink it. Uh, and that was important for me. And like, I, I wanted to sort of shake off some of the tradition that the, the competition had kind of created. Um, and do stuff like Paul Capp's table side, which they let me do by mistake, I think. Because back then the rules said you had to pour all four, you had to serve four drinks simultaneously. That was the rules back then. And I was like, hey, I'd like to pour my drinks table side. And I think they, they thought I meant I would pour all four drinks table side, put the four drinks down and go. Whereas instead I poured each one and chatted it and kind of went that way. And once they let it through, then the competition sort of shifted and everyone was like, oh, we can do that now. And that was, that was kind of the innovations that I was interested in pushing through at the time. Um, but I wasn't trying to win, I was just trying not to make a fool of myself. So I don't think you can try and win barista competition. I think it's bad to try and win barista competition. I think the competition has had some lasting effect on the, the general industry in, in smaller ways. And in, and in pretty simple ways also. Um, you know, I think there are basic standards around espresso prep technique now that are global. And a few years ago, there was some discussion, I think, about getting rid of the technical sheet because technical points amongst most good competitors are almost identical. Um, and there's a kind of a what's the point, everyone's technically competent, and they were like, no, 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 no. In so many countries, this is a teaching aid. This is, the, the, the score sheet itself is a technical how to make espresso properly, that you should flush your group head then, that you should be dry wiping this, you should be clean, you should be consistent. And I, I think it, it set a, a kind of global standard of basic technique that we forget about because it's become so normal to watch someone go through that build process and so many little habits are just there now that weren't there 10 years ago, do you know what I mean? Like it was very much the more Italian, like some coffee in a plastic tamp attached to a grinder and like off we go, there was coffee. So 
weirdly that kind of stuff I think has, has kind of leaked out into the real world. Um, and I think slowly but surely the idea that coffee, coffee's taste and it's excellent is linked to both the product and the preparation. You know what I mean? That people understand increasingly, and I think we forget that people don't, that coffee can be made well or badly. That there is a skill to making coffee well. And there is also a quality inherent in the product itself. And, you know, we have a ubiquitous commoditized product in our culture. Coffee is coffee. It's bitter. It's sometimes more bitter than others. People, most consumers wouldn't understand why though. They wouldn't be like, oh, this is bitter because they don't clean their equipment. They wouldn't be like, oh, this is bitter because they're using a dark roast or, you know, whereas with a steak, they're like, oh, they burnt the steak. You know what I mean? I understand preparation. Or they're like, oh, this is just a cheap cut. This doesn't, this is not good tasting meat. We understand that. We understand that that is not a commoditized thing. But with coffee, we're still uh, spreading that message. And I think the competition has helped with that. That, you know, even if it is for that weird one minute of awkward conversation on the breakfast news show on ABC or whoever else, you know, like there is still that moment where we're like, hey, here's someone really good at something and it happens to be coffee and you can be good at that. And that little message I think is still very valuable. I think if I look to the future of WBC, I have to try really hard to disconnect myself from my past experiences and I'll explain what I mean. I find competition hard to watch in some ways now because I think this will be my 10th or 11th year around competitions and I've seen a lot and, um, and so for me part of me is like we've got to change it all up, we've got to get, it's boring, it's like we're doing the same thing, forgetting that for most people going into competition it's their first time. I mean, this is entirely new to them. It's all new ideas, it's all a whole new thing. Or it's their second or third year. Very few people make it to a, a 10 year competition anniversary. And it is weird for me to be back in Seattle in 2015 and I first came to Seattle in 2005 for the WBC to be a coach for a UK competitor. So it's, it's, it's a strange one to think how many of these things I've seen. So I don't think there's gonna necessarily be radical changes in it. I think it will continue to evolve and it is changing up some rules this year, which is good. And I think as technology evolves, that inevitably incorporates itself into competition. Uh, but I think ultimately it's still a great way to find an ambassador. You know, I think it found a great ambassador last year in, in Hidenori. I think he's been uh, a great kind of champion for us to, to hand over to someone new this year. So I, I don't anticipate a huge number of changes and I think that's okay because it's not a competition for me anymore. Uh, it doesn't need to be entirely new all the time because it is new to most people coming in.